Okay, and how do I share my screen? Share screen. Okay, can you guys see this? Yes. Okay, excellent. So my name is Dejara Wellens. I am an internal medicine physician, just kind of graduated out of residency this past year. Um, I am working as a nocturnist currently, which is a, a hospitalist, but I work solely nights. So that's what we're kind of gonna go into, kind of how I got here initially. So I did my undergraduate, I got my, my bachelor's in biology at UTSA. Uh, my GPA was not the best. Um, but, you know, somewhere in all of this, I decided that I needed to get some extracurriculars and get my feet wet into medicine because it's what I always knew that I wanted to do. So I went and became an EMT, which is kind of an extreme, but that's what I wanted to do. I'm sorry. Um, so that's what I wanted to do. I went and became a medic. Let me put this down here. Um, so you see me here with my firefighters. Um, I was the only medic in the medic only within a fire department. So it was a quite an interesting experience. Clearly I am uh, beating the boys at arm wrestling. It was a great, great experience for me. Um, and I kind of through my, my undergraduate, I decided that I needed MCAT prep because I was absolutely not prepared to take the MCAT. And that combined with my not so great GPA meant that I needed to work a little bit harder. Um, so I initially um, attempted and decided that I did not want to go directly into medical school. I went and got my master's. So that's what we're going to go through here. So I got my graduate degree, a master's in biomedical science at the uh, Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine right outside of Atlanta. And I had to take the MCAT three times during those two years because standardized testing is not my thing whatsoever. I struggle with it and always have. Um, but, you know, I was successful on the third attempt and PCOM Georgia actually accepted me into their medical program from there. So, you know, through there, I did have to take my boards. Uh, my GPA was okay, uh, but I did not do well on my first level one exam. Again, standardized testing is not my thing. I am great at medicine. I'm great at peopling but the, it's the exams that kind of trip me up occasionally. However, I was able to successfully pass and you know, I, I did okay all through my, my level two and, and beyond. So um, you know, I went into the match initially wanting to do emergency medicine. That did not work out for me the first go round again, because there's always kind of a hurdle when it comes to me and this journey. Um, and so you know, if I could say anything through all of this, I would like to encourage anyone, if you are struggling, does not mean that you cannot get here. I am a testimony that you can still succeed at this, even if you have some hurdles, okay? So I did not match into emergency medicine the first year. I scrambled into a tra transitional year, which was a, an isolated intern year at Garden City Hospital. And, um, you know, I realized when I was working with all of the internal medicine physicians there that I actually, my personality fit much more with um, internal medicine than it actually did with emergency medicine. Now, while I love EM, it has a special place in my heart. I enjoy the idea as a hospitalist in particular, being able to get a patient from the ER, further work them up, figure out exactly what's going on with them and seeing them transition from being very, very sick to being back to their baseline or as close as we can get to their baseline before sending them home and on their way. So that is what I do as an internist, as a hospitalist. Um, so anyway, I got into the, med the medicine program there. Um, so they kind of fostered that I am heart that I have now. And I was, you know, I successfully graduated in 2021. So as a hospitalist, slash nocturnist. I solely work within the hospital system. I don't do any office. I actually think office is exhausting for me. I would rather do my 13 hour shifts in the hospital than an eight hour shift in the office. And I know for some people that sounds absolutely crazy, but I love the, the hospital setting. I love being able to have all the consultants there with me. Um, I love being able to talk one-on-one -on -one with nurses and being able to see my patients through their whole entire course. 
So the pros of working specifically at night. Now, most people don't wanna work nights. So you have more demand, which means you get higher pay. I get higher pay than the day shift people at my hospital. I have more independence per se, because I simply get to do medicine. I just get to practice medicine. I don't have to worry about the, you know, the, the social things during the day. I don't have to talk to as many family members during the day, which I love talking to them, but I would rather just do medicine. Um, and then I work fewer shifts because I work a longer shift, a 13 hour shift. I only work 11 days in a 28 day cycle. So I have a lot of free time to spend this extra money that I get compared to my colleagues. Um, now, some of the cons of working as a nocturnist would be sleep cycle issues. It is a huge thing for some people to adjust from days to nights on a regular basis. Luckily for me, my shifts are kind of uh, grouped together. So I'll work maybe five shifts you know, this week and I'll have 10 days off and then I'll work six shifts um, and then have another 10 or so days off. Um, so I am actually able to adjust easily. Some people aren't able to do that and they struggle. Um, now your personal life will have to make an adjustment because it's easy enough to work a 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and be able to meet your family for dinner or go to that function. But I cannot do that because I am working nights. I can't, so I miss a lot of evening events and celebrations. Um, but luckily I try, my friends and family all try to make sure it happens within my off days. So that it usually is okay. And then working alone for some people might be a con. I think it's a pro personally, because again, I love my patients. I don't necessarily like a lot of people per se. So I get to practice medicine by myself for the most part. I have one other colleague, but there's not as many moving parts at night as there are during the day. And my typical work day, I come to work at about 6 p.m. and I receive sign out from the day shift and I take the admit slash transfer phone. We take transfers from all over the country essentially, but really all over Michigan. We are a tertiary care center, which means that we have every specialty that you can think of, um, really advanced care that we can do at our hospital. So those smaller community hospitals that maybe can't handle something, they are calling me at night and saying, hey doc, this patient's really sick, can you please take them? So that's what I do. And my team covers a wide range of people at night. We cover more, more um, specialties at night than, than we do during the day. So I get a lot of insight into a lot of different uh, diseases, which is really cool also. So I cover bone marrow and stem cell transplant patients. I cover lung transplant patients, the chemo floor, um, I cover advanced heart failure, um, which is, is probably my bread and butter. I have a lot of advanced heart failure patients that are on artificial devices. Uh, I cover telemetry. These are patients that may have issues with their heart rates that we need to keep a closer eye on. You know, those monitors that they stick onto their chest. We can see the, the, the EKGs and things from the, from the screens. And then I cover an observation unit, which I collaborate with the nurse practitioners and PAs there. They actually manage the patients for the most part. I go downstairs maybe about halfway through my shift and I check on those patients and we uh, collaborate on them as well. And these are patients that aren't super duper sick, but they're a little bit too sick to go home. So I cover from the super duper sick to the kind of sick. And um, I take about five or so admits for me, usually about five or so admits for my, my counterpart. And then I get an additional couple down in the OBS unit. Um, the cool thing, if I don't want to at night, I don't have to round on every single patient on our list. I round on the patients that I maybe admitted the night before to check on them. Um, I don't have to have that, that, uh, that strict sort of, I need to see this list of 20 every single night. No, I see the list that, of the patients that I maybe have seen throughout the week. Um, but I don't actually have to write notes on that, which is really cool. And the downside is that I get a lot of nursing calls, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. My pager is constantly going off to answer things like, hey doc, can this patient get Tylenol? Hey doc, this patient is you know, crashing. Can you please come and check on them? And then I get the occasional rapid response or code, code blue, uh, meaning that somebody is crashing uh, hard. So I, I handle those things as well and oftentimes have to manage them, stabilize them as much as I can and call the ICU. And then, you know, somewhere during this shift, they typically fly by, especially when it's really busy. I sign out at 7 a.m. to the day team. So for now, before we get into a case, does anyone have any particular questions about kind of my journey or 
my work day, my workflow. I have a question. Sure. Um, so have you ever felt with or dealt with imposter syndrome? Yes, all and the time. Did you like combat that? You know, it is something that I still struggle with occasionally. It is, I am big on positive affirmations and repetitive positive thinking. So um, it is actually one of my, one of my, my platforms is positive affirmation and positive thinking and sort of a, a well-rounded approach to your life. Um, so when these negative thoughts come in and you're thinking, you know, everyone else is smarter than me, there's no way I deserve to be here. You have to have sort of a tool, a toolbox to, to go into that proves that, hey, I am, you know, I am the SHIT. I can do this as well as anyone else. Um, and so I constantly remind myself that I deserve to be here just like everyone else. And if I didn't deserve to be here, guess what? I would not. Um, and also understanding that those people that you are comparing yourself to, which is often where imposter syndrome comes from, you have no idea what it took for that person to get there. You don't actually know their journey. Um, so it's really hard to put yourself in that place and compare yourself when you have absolutely nothing, like you have, you have no idea what brought that person there. Um, so that's important to remember. And also remember that a lot of people are flexing. They actually may not have it all together. They may not be as smart as they're letting on. They actually probably failed that test instead of, you know, they're bragging about getting, they, they aced it. You would be very, very surprised. So stay in your lane, stay focused. And anytime those negative thoughts come in, make sure that you have something to go back on that says, hey, I deserve this. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. Anyone else? Okay. Okay, so we're gonna do a quick patient. It's one of the ones that I had in residency that kind of threw me for a loop. We're gonna keep it really simple. I'm not gonna go into to too much detail. Is everyone here is pre-med, is that correct? Uh, we're a mix of high school students who are interested in pre-med and college students who are actually pre-med. Okay, okay, so we'll keep it kind of basic. So we have a 55-year-old Indian male who is coming in uh, with a medical history of hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. So we're going to kind of run this like a patient that I would get coming, you know, I, I get a call from the ER that says, hey, doc, we got a patient. Um, this is what they came in with chills, shortness of breath, and generalized weakness. And this is how we're going to work them up. And do you have any suggestions? And then I take it from there. So they get the medical history again, hypertension, diabetes, morbid obesity. He's had one, um, one kidney removed because of cancer and he does he does not smoke he does not drink and he does not use illicit drugs but he comes in with chills shortness of breath and weakness okay so you, when your patient comes in through the er they're going to get this basic stuff and they're going to get a set of vitals so we see that his heart rate is elevated at 106 beats per minute his blood pressure is a little high at 145 over 95 He's got a bit of a temp, 101 over or 101.2, and he's breathing 93% on room air. So, you know, for a typical healthy person, low 90s is not, is not usual. So we can see that this patient is obviously sick. One of the first things you want to do when you get to a patient is figure out sick or not sick, right? These vital signs tell us that somebody is probably sick, combined with their chief complaint of chills, shortness of breath, and weakness we obviously know that we have a sick patient. The next thing you wanna do is what we call the review of systems. You wanna ask a patient a bunch of questions and kind of categorize it into um, things that they say they do have and things that they say that they don't. These are called pertinent positives and pertinent negatives. Uh, when you have a patient that comes in, you wanna ask them, you know, how long has this been going on? Doc, it's been going on for three days. Uh, myalgia means that he's got muscle aches and pains. Um, he also complains of shortness of breath. He's got some chest pain and he's got a decreased appetite. So, you know, automatically you're thinking, okay, this patient could have a few different things. Um, and then the things that we also asked that he denies were runny nose, rhinorrhea, uh, blurry vision, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, and he had no urinary symptoms. So, 
let's see here what we're going to do next. So once you've talked to your patient, then you want to touch the patient. You want to be able to figure out what's going on with them. You want to do your physical exam. So, you know, you start with your general exam. This patient is obese. He does look sick. And we know that based on our vitals and kind of what he's been complaining about, but he's not distressed. He doesn't look like he is um, completely crashing. Um, cardiovascular, you want to listen to the heart. It's regular rate and rhythm, no murmurs, no rubs, no gout. So that's a good sounding heart. You want to listen to the lungs. So he's got decreased breath sounds and a faint wheeze when, she, you know, when you're listening with your stethoscope. So these sort of things can kind of point you in the direction. This patient came in with shortness of breath. He's got decreased breath sounds. He's got a wheeze. So something is probably going on in his lungs based on his complaints and the way he looks. Uh, the rest of the exam is benign. His abdomen is soft. His extremities aren't too bad. He's got a little bit of edema, meaning swelling, and his skin is clear. He's got no rashes. So that's good, but we clearly can kind of point in you. This is, this is what internal medicine is all about. Well, really all of medicine is all about this. If you can get a good physical exam, if you can get a good history on your patient, you're going to be able to, to pare things down and figure out what's going on with them. So the next thing I would do is come up with what we call a differential diagnosis. This is a list of things that you think could possibly be wrong. And I'm gonna stop here for now and see if anyone has any ideas. There are no wrong answers, there's no stupid answers. Give me anything you think that could be wrong based on what we talked about so far. in the chat, pneumonia or upper respiratory virus. That's a great, great option, Abby. I love that. It's kind of classic for, for pneumonia and upper respiratory. Exactly, those are great options as well. Um, so COVID, because of the times that we're in, absolutely. Heart failure is a great, great choice as well. These are very, very symptoms, uh, very, very common symptoms of both and viral illness for sure. I would agree with that as well. Okay, so here's some things. So once you kind of gotten all of that, you can basically just make a list of the things that you think is wrong with the patient. And from there, you start your workup. So things that could be going on, pneumonia would be at the top of the list, absolutely. An MI, meaning a heart attack, myocardial infarction or MI or heart attack, same thing. He could have a simple UTI, sure. You know, people can have more than one thing going on just because he has some shortness of breath doesn't mean that he doesn't have a urinary tract infection or an STD. Um, you can think of um, pulmonary embolus. Maybe he's got a blood clot. That would explain why his breath sounds are so decreased or why his oxygen is a little low. Um, remember this patient also had, you want to think about their, their, their history as well. This patient also had a kidney cancer in the past. So maybe he's got a malignancy, a cancer that's kind of resurged um, back up. Oh, there's a little gnat here. Um, you wanna think about the flu because of the time that we're in as well. COVID-19, again, great. And his sugar was a little high on our, on our um, initial labs, um, or I don't even think we've gotten to the labs, but it could be something called DKA, meaning diabetic ketoacidosis, kind of those chills and vague symptoms. Maybe he's got a little something else going on. So once you come up with your, di your differential, then you start ordering up your labs. So let's see what's abnormal. Let's go over just the abnormal thing. So we get a basic metabolic panel, the BMP, and we see that his glucose is slightly elevated, which, you know, in a morbidly obese American male, he probably has diabetes. He just may not have known it. Um, and then we can look at the CBC, meaning the complete blood count, his hemoglobin, his, his hemoglobin and hematocrit, I mean, they're fine. The thing that we wanna look at right now are the white blood cells are 14,000, this is elevated. So the white blood cells are kind of our key that there's an infection going on, likely a bacterial infection, but if there's an infection going on somewhere in this man's body. And the cardiac enzyme, meaning troponin and these other labs are all okay. The thing that you wanna get when you have a really sick patient is what we call blood cultures and urine cultures as well. And you send those down to the lab and they try to grow any sort of bacteria. Remember your blood should be sterile, so nothing should grow, um, but you still wanna send that down just in case. So 
we get an image of this patient. And first let's look at the normal chest X-ray over here on the left. You can see the bones, you know, the lungs in the black space. You should see a lot of black space with some linear markings, some lines that's just kind of um, between the, the blood vessels and the actual um, airways of the, of the lungs. You can see the shadow of the heart. This down here is the diaphragm. I'm sure we all know what all of these organs are. You just may not have seen it on an x-ray before. And then you have the spine. So this is a fairly normal x-ray for, um, for a, a male. Now, if you look at our patient's x-ray over here on the right, does anyone see where there might be a problem? Is it in the, this is the right lung over here. Is it in the left lung? Where is the problem? Right lung or left lung? Right lung, correct. So our issue, uh -oh, our issue is in the, well, our issue is in the right lung, kind of right here. This is where you have a problem. And this is pretty classic for pneumonia. So um, I think it was Abby that, that said pneumonia was up there on the list, absolutely. And the other options, again, guys, were not incorrect. It's just not what this patient had. Um, so yes, this patient has pneumonia. So what you would do in a normal case is you, as the hospitalist, the, the medicine doctor, even the ER, you would start this patient on antibiotics for this pneumonia and hope that he gets better. So this patient was admitted into the hospital. I took over and, um, you know, he was fine. He was getting better. His fever had broken because of the antibiotics, but there was a plot twist in this. And this is the cool thing about being a hospitalist is that you can see when things don't quite fit the picture. So on hospital day three, this patient spikes a fever of 103 and a new heart murmur. So a, a heart that we initially said was normal. We said it sounded great. Now he's got extra sounds going on in his heart and he's got a new fever. And we finally get our blood cultures that we sent off on day one and we show that it is growing bacteria, Staph aureus. So the next thing that we obtain because of this new heart murmur, the fever and this bacteria is what we call an echo. And this is kind of advanced, but what I want you guys to see, so this is basically an ultrasound of the heart. The only thing I want you to take away from this, well, if it will let me play, it may not let me play it. No? Okay, well, we had a uh, regular ultrasound of the heart. And then here on this side, there is a little growth going on in the heart. And basically what happens is this is called endocarditis. And this is something that we do see often, but it's not something that we typically expect in a, in a fairly healthy, you know, 45 year old male. Basically, he, the pneumonia was so bad that the bacteria got into his bloodstream. And from there, even though we gave him antibiotics, it was not enough. And that bacteria basically seeded, it started growing in a, in a little form of what we call a vegetation within the heart valve. And so when we listen to his heart on day three, that extra sound, that new murmur is because he grew that vegetation because of the bacteria, because of the pneumonia. So, you know, you can have a very simple, straightforward case in the hospital, or you can have things that advance very quickly like his did. So he obviously is much sicker than we thought that he was. And just really quick, again, kind of a schematic here. You have the heart. These are the valves here. We won't go into all of that, but what you can, does someone have a question? Oh, um, so what you see here, this nastiness, this is the bacteria essentially growing within the heart chamber and that's not good. People can get very sick very quickly. So what I described as that vegetation, this is um, obviously a, um, a heart valve that they have taken out. You can see what should be normal tissue here. And then you can see this little growth there. And that is what was causing his heart murmur. That is what was causing his extra fever. And then down here, just some examples of some other issues you can run in with endocarditis that we won't get into. Um, but this is what this patient actually, uh, this is the part that made him the most sick. So typically how this happens, is you have um, 
Usually this is in IV drug users because again, blood should be sterile, right? But if you are using IV drugs and you are using dirty needles, that bacteria is gonna get into the blood. So this is the most common thing that I see, but occasionally you can have somebody just with a really bad pneumonia that can get this as well. Any kind of way for bacteria to get into the blood, this can happen. So there's some common bacteria called Staphylococcus and Streptococcus, but there's some others. Uh, basically they adhere to the valve and this leads to an accumulation leading to what we call this vegetation. Um, and it can, these, these little vegetations can actually shoot off within the bloodstream because obviously the heart is what's gonna be responsible for the rest of the blood supply. Uh, you can get that bacteria that goes into all other parts of the, the, the body causing all sorts of issues like pancreatitis that he didn't have when he came in. Um, he can, you can get these, um, these can go up into the lungs and you can have issues there further from his pneumonia. And these can also actually go up into the brain as well and cause strokes. So it's a really, really, really big deal when we find something like this. So the next steps for this patient were two to eight weeks of antibiotics instead of his normal five to seven days, which we would do for pneumonia. Now he needs a much longer term and much closer observation. And he, his vegetation was large enough that he actually needed surgery to go and remove it from the heart. So we had to transfer him. Um, to another facility. And then um, from, from now until the end of time, he's gonna always need antibiotics before he goes in for any dental procedures or surgeries. And that's to prevent this from happening again. So that is kind of my why I love internal medicine slash hospital medicine is because, you know, you get something that you think is just straightforward and, you know, you come in the next day and the patient's crashing and you have no idea why you realize like, wow, this patient was actually much sicker than I thought that they were. Um, so there's a lot of plot twists that can happen. Um, so yeah, does anyone have any questions about this case or anything else going on? Anything not related to the case, just simply medicine, we can just chat. Um, what would you say are the, the hardest or greatest challenges you faced during medical school and then residency? My hardest challenges were absolutely passing boards. It is a tough thing for me. Um, again, I love the hospital and I love the practice of medicine, but it was really, really tough for me to sit down for eight hours and, you know, focus on 400 questions, um, and learning how to take those tests was a big hurdle for me. Um, you know, being in particular, being a black woman in medicine and being a part of less than 2% of people in medicine, I, and doing med medical school in the South. In particular, um, you know, I did run into some issues in that regard. Um, and if anyone has any questions about handling those things, we can we can chat about that over on my Instagram. Um, but I did run into some issues um, being a minority as well, unfortunately. But also kind of fortunately because it, you know, it, it made me the the person that I am and the advocate that I am today. As an IM doctor, what constitutes the point where you have to pass a patient off or consult a field specialist? Great question versus handling a case on your own. So as, a, as, a, as an internist, I am trained in kind of a really, really wide range. We study cardiac, we study, we study the kidney, we study the, the study of the human body as it works as a whole. We're not super duper subspecialized. So I can handle almost anything. But there are cases where you have advanced heart failure, which me as an internist, I should not be handling advanced heart failure. That should be a, um, uh, a cardiologist in particular. So that is when I consult. Um, when I have a kidney failure that I can't explain or can't fix, I consult the nephrologist. So anything that I feel like I'm, I'm in over my head or if I want to kind of cut it off at the pass before it gets out of hand, I simply call up my buddies and I say, hey, you know, this patient's really sick. I think they, I think they have appendicitis and I call my surgeon. So I can consult anyone for, for any amount of, you know, any issue like a stroke or something like that. Um, and I'm kind of the, the middle, the middle man. So I mostly manage the patient and, you know, patients have all these, these sick things going on. I consult, I consult, and then I kind of monitor the whole situation and get them ready for discharge as best as I can. Um, but for the most part, for simple things like, you know, a simple pneumonia, I can handle that by myself. Um, 
uh, let's see, a simple high blood pressure that's uncontrolled, I can handle that by myself. But there are some cases where I need to, to reach out. Okay, I live in, so Ashley says, I live in Texas and I'm interested in attending UTSA. What's the community and education like at UTSA? So I am a grandmother, okay, I'm an auntie. So I don't know what it's like now, but, um, and I was kind of a loner in, in college, which probably was helpful because I do think that any college can be a college, you know, can be that the typical party crowd if you really want to find it. But I found that the, um, the support was, was pretty good. I found, um, uh, you know, like the, 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 the counseling and things and kind of guiding me through my, my journey and the, the courses that I needed to take. That was also very good. The great thing about uh, San Antonio is that there's a lot to do. Um, and UTSA is very involved and connected within the community. So there's a lot of opportunity for, for community outreach. There's now sports, there's all sorts of things. Um, would I recommend University of Texas for your degree? Absolutely. I love UTSA. I love UT in, in general. Um, I would, it does come highly recommended. So I did okay. Um, if this patient was a kidney transplant recipient, would the management change? Ooh, so a kidney transplant patient, it, the management doesn't necessarily change, but you do want to pay, pay really, really close attention to those kidney numbers every single day on those patients because they are already on immunosuppressive drugs. So they can get really, really sick really quickly. And the thing that you don't want to happen is for their kidney transplant to fail because of how sick that they are. So if I have a transplant patient, the thing that I think that I would change would be immediately consulting a nephrologist. There's no way I would have a kidney transplant patient in my hospital without at least getting a nephrologist on board to, to, to monitor things very, very closely and make changes if we need to. I have another question. Sure. Um, did you always want to be a doctor? And like, is being a doctor now like everything that you imagined? I assume it's not. But <laughs> <laughs> it has its pros and its cons. Um, I always wanted to be a physician since I was, and I don't even know where that came from. Um, my parents would say, I think they, I don't, you guys are probably all way too young to remember the Beverly Hillbillies, but um, the granny on there was the, was the doctor. And I just, I want to be like granny, apparently is what I said. Um, and these were some, some country bumpkins, you know, that had moved to, to, to Hollywood. Anyway, long story short, I guess that's where it started. And is it worth it? It was worth everything to me. It was worth the setbacks. It was worth the tears. Um, in the moment, did I think that? Absolutely not. You have no idea how many times I wanted to quit. Um, you know, when you are, a lot of us are type A and for me, never having had to study in high school and getting to college and being like, holy moly, I just failed an exam for the first time in my life. It's a very humbling experience. And I was just, you know, in biochem and I was thinking, there's no way I can do this. Like, there's no way. Um, but all of that was worth it. I think in today's climate, things are a bit more of a headache, things that I did not sign up for uh, when it comes to, to dealing with COVID and, and battling the, the lay person and, and what COVID is and what it isn't, the vaccine, what it is and what it isn't. That has caused a lot of burnout in a lot of us. Um, but outside of that, absolutely worth it for me. I love, love, love my job. I just have a follow-up question to that. Sure. Um, so how do you deal with people who are vaccine, vaccine hesitant? Like how do you, how would someone, I guess, address like family members who think that? <sighs> Good. Initially, I was, I got, you know, very passionate about it and tried to change their minds and, and things like that. It's really hard now because of the, the burnout that that, that, that that passion has caused. So I tend to only, offer my opinion if it's asked um, because people and there I've done my research thing I just I personally tend to stay away I tend to stay away from it because it really can cause um, it, it hurts my heart a little bit you know um, so but if they have real genuine questions I do try to guide it and see where like what their actual hesitation is because oftentimes you'll realize that people's hesitation is based off of something that 
is completely far left field. And sometimes, just sometimes, if you figure that out, you can kind of guide them back to, to the middle ground and make them start over. Um, so that's usually my hope, just to get them back to the middle ground and not way out in the left field. Um, so that's, that's my hope. Okay. I have a, oh, sorry. Oh, sure. um, so um, you, you said you struggled with um, like standardized testing and testing in general. So what are some of the most effective study methods that you've used in the past that uh, have helped you um, overcome this challenge? Learning what my study um, uh, retention came from. So for me, I realized that I could not just sit and read a book and highlight it and for it to make sense to where I can take a, a, a test. So I had to start watching a lot of videos. I had to do uh, repetitive flashcards. I had to do repetitive you know, questions. That is what I needed to do. So I did a lot of drawing out pathways. I drew them out a million times if I needed to, to get it to, to stick. Um, so repetition is huge, whether that is drawing it out, whether that's watching a video, whether that is reading it. Um, and then I'm big on doing practice questions because doing the practice questions is what's going to gear you and kind of make your brain think for the actual exam and not just these, you know, uh, this hodgepodge of information from the book. You need to know how to take the test. So do the practice questions as many as you can get your hands on. Um, and take as many practice exams as you can as well and set it up the exact same way as you would take the exam. No distractions, no to turn off the phones, um, those sorts of things. So that would be my most effective uh, study tip for you or most effective study tips. That's what we're gonna... Thank you. I think we had a couple of questions in the chat that I missed your least favorite case to consult on and why? <sighs> my, le my least favorite case to have in general is when I can tell that a patient is faking or pain seeking. It is a huge problem and they admit them through the ER um, because the ER gets sick of them. And so they'll say, okay, fine, we'll just keep you and we'll let the hospitalist handle it. And I show up and I'm looking at the patient you know, from the, from the doorway and they're on their phone chatting it up or eating. And I come in the room, what's going on? Oh, doc, you know, my stomach hurts and, you know, my head hurts and I need morphine. And, and then you have to negotiate or, or tell them straight up, no, there's a lot of angry pain seeking patients. So pain, pain seeking in particular is my least favorite case. My least, least, least favorite case. Um, now, how do you recommend studying in college and medical school? Any advice about chem <laughs> majors? Good luck. Um, no, uh, again, repetition, repetition, repetition. For that biochem, drawing out those pathways, don't just stare at them, draw them out. Um, for anyone in college, really go to office hours as often as possible. Go to those study groups. If you, you know, if, if you realize that you're not getting it on your own, sometimes talking it out and drawing things out with a group can be very, very helpful. Um, so that would be my, my, my tips for anyone in college trying to get through it and, and figuring out how to study. And that's even through medical school. Excuse me. What do you do to maintain your wellness as an attending? So as an attending, I clearly have more free time and more free funds. So I do a lot of things for wellness now. Um, I'm big on travel. Within the past four months, I've been to Costa Rica. I've been to Peru. I climbed Machu Picchu. Um, I've been to Atlanta three times. So that's usually what I do for my quote unquote wellness, kind of how I get away. Um, that's the big things. But the smaller day-to-day -day things for me, which I would recommend for you all, is one drink enough water. You have to drink water. Please, please, please drink water. Uh, take your multivitamins if you need to, if you're not getting a balanced meal. And then um, the other thing is finding time to work out, move your body. It doesn't have to be CrossFit. You don't have to go super hard in the paint, but you know, even going out for a walk, stepping away from 
your books occasionally, getting out there and doing something that you love, whether it's a dance class or you run or Orange Theory or whatever it is, you can find the time. And I, I kind of have this 30 day challenge going on with some of my people on, on Instagram where I challenge them to work out every day for 30 days to push themselves for 30 minutes a day. Everyone can figure out 30 minutes to dedicate towards themselves. Do not let medicine drain you of your energy and your soul. Find something that you love and make sure that you're doing it. And it doesn't have to be traveling and spending a bunch of money. Uh, did I miss anything? Let's see. Oh, what else I do as an attending now? Like, you know, I'm big on spa days and, and you know, getting away and that sort of thing. But that comes with, with having more time and more money. I absolutely could not do that in residency or medical school. My favorite place. Um, so overall, the favorite place that I've traveled. I loved Costa Rica. I did love Costa Rica, but I also love Mexico. But I also really, really, really love Dubai. I don't think I've quite reached a favorite quite yet. Um, but the idea, I think what was really cool about this trip to Peru this time is that I rode, you know, first class for the first time and it was a six hour flight and having my meals and I had filet mignon and those sorts of things, which were, which were lovely. So that was probably the favorite part of that trip, but I haven't quite reached that, that peak. I would say Machu Picchu was an amazing experience. It was almost uh, transformative being up there. I will say that. What is a place you recommend traveling to? So on a budget, um, on a med school budget, you can get to Mexico very easily. Um, and it's usually fairly inexpensive to go there. So that would be, if you just have, you know, four, four days and a couple hundred bucks to, to throw away, I would say just go, go right down to Mexico. If you've got more time and more money, I would say go overseas. Dubai is an amazing experience. It's also a very pricey experience. Um, and then finding places with, within your area that you may not have even thought about. So, you know, here in Michigan, which I'm not the biggest fan of Michigan, however, it is a very, very beautiful state. So I oftentimes will just take a weekend and go up north. Um, it's fall, it's beautiful out. So finding even local things near you uh, to do for your wellness, for your traveling experience, you should, you can do that as well. You mentioned you work 11 out of 28 days. So did you get to pick the number of hours you work um, and when to work or was your schedule given to you? So uh, kind of a little bit of both. I can place a request for the person who makes the schedule. I can say, you know, I already know that I have this vacation plan for these days. I just simply tell them the scheduler like, hey, I have something going on on these days. Can you make sure that we can work around it if possible? And we usually are able to uh, work around it without me actually taking dedicated vacation days. The cool thing about where I work now is that on top of my 11 days that I work, I can also take vacation. So it may be a, um, a month where I only work five days uh, because I took vacation. Um, so that's the, the beauty of kind of working with people that are that are reasonable and accommodating is that I can I can sort of preset my schedule as best as I can. And then if there's a weekend that comes up or a day that comes up and I just need to switch it with somebody, most of my colleagues are, are willing to switch without issues because we're we all in the same boat. Anyone else have any particular questions? Medicine, hospital, or otherwise? Okay, Amy says, my cousin wants to study medicine as well, but she's debating over it because she's afraid that she'll be unable to overcome the fear of cutting open flesh and seeing organs. <laughs> I mean, that's a, I'm laughing, but that is a very valid <laughs> concern. Um, did you have the fear before becoming a physician? If so, how did you overcome the fear? Could you give some suggestions over this issue? So the only time that you will have to cut someone open and see organs 
I mean, if you're not going to become a surgeon is, I mean, they're, they're not that often. So in medical school, you have your anatomy lab. So that would be your first occurrence, which for me, I've never been, a, I've never been afraid of the human body. Again, I worked as a medic. So I saw people, you know, in many different compromising positions after car accidents and things, and there were organs everywhere. So organs never quite bothered me in that way. But however, when I got to anatomy lab on day one of medical school, they said, you're going to the lab and they just had the bodies just out. And I kind of had to take a moment um, because I, I was not prepared for that. Uh, but, you know, other than the, the smell, if I can be frank, it's really not that bad. Um, going into medicine, you are gonna have to have occasions where you are gonna need to touch the inside of the human body. So if it is a complete fear, like a phobia, I would say maybe it's not for her, but if it is something that she may be able to at least start watching a few videos on anatomy and seeing it being, you know, seeing it happen and start to sort of sensitize herself to it, maybe it won't be so bad. Um, and then outside of your, you know, your anatomy lab and, and medical school, once you get into residency, you may rotate through general surgery. So you'll obviously have to hold a few organs at that point. Um, you're going to have to go through OBGYN and watch babies be delivered. So if blood and guts and poop and vomit and other bodily output things, if it's really going to be, you know, a big phobia, you may want to do something a little bit different. that makes sense, Amy? Okay. Anyone else? I don't think anybody else has any more questions unless I'm wrong and anybody has some last minute question that they want to put in the chat really quickly. But I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. I personally learned a lot and I also am not like the best standardized tester. So um, again, I just really love the whole thing. Like even though I'm not the best standardized tester, I could still become a doctor in the future. And yeah, thank you so much for speaking with us again. And of course. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you guys so much for having me. If anyone does have any other questions that they didn't feel comfortable asking here, um, you know, you can always DM me on through my Instagram and, and we can chat there as well. So thank you guys so much for having me though. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome.